Hello, good morning. My name is David Carroll. I'm the director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. And on behalf of the Carter Center and the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you to today's International Day of Democracy panel on safeguarding, uh, promoting human rights, safeguarding elections, and strengthening democracy. Uh, we are coming to you through the Carter Center's Forum on Human Rights uh, on this panel on human rights and elections uh, and strengthening democracy. This. Um, Day is an important opportunity for us to remember and to reflect on the role of democracy and human rights and the connections between them and to think about some of the things, some of the big underlying questions. What does democracy mean to us as, as citizens and individuals? Uh, what are the achievements and the benefits that democracy can bring to us and to our societies? But also importantly, what are the challenges that democracy faces? Uh, around the world and in, in countries uh, in all parts of the world. Today's uh, panel is going to focus on some of these questions and the connection between human rights and democracy and how central that is to the challenges we face. The link between democracy and human rights was highlighted back in as early as 1948 in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, Article 21, which reads, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government, this shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage, and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. That was elaborated further in the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights and other human rights institutions, uh, instruments and treaties, which together really bound states to ensure protection for these rights and underline how critical it was that uh, human rights were there to ensure inclusive and participatory processes. And we know that democratic, uh, strong democratic governance can also help bolster, bolster a, a whole uh, range of human rights, not just civil and political, but also economic, cultural and, and social rights. Yet it, today it's evident that democracy is facing challenges all around the world. Uh, there's rising authoritarianism and countries uh, across the world are experiencing deterioration in, in these rights. According to uh, a recent Freedom House report, 75% of the world's population is living in countries where there's been a deterioration in, in de democracy. And we know that with that goes uh, closures and shrinking of political space and protections for uh, key human rights. So in today's panel, we really want to focus on this critical relationship between human rights and, and elections, uh, the role that human rights plays in ensuring that election, elections can be genuinely democratic and can uh, ensure that full participation uh, by all citizens. But also we want to look at how these two communities that, that work on these such, sets of issues, human rights and elections, can work more closely together and can reinforce one another in those efforts to ensure that our societies can be places where human rights and democracy both flourish. Um, I, we have a, a great panel set of panelists. Uh, we hope that they will be able to draw on their unique experiences working uh, in regions all across the world to try to illustrate some of the examples and lessons learned from applying rights-based approaches to, to democracy and elections. Uh, before we move to start the discussion and I introduce the panelists, I'd like very uh, briefly to ask my colleague at the uh, UN Office of the High Commissioner, Hernan Valles, to, uh, to make a few comments, if you could. Hernan, please. Yes, thank you, David, and happy International Day of Democracy to everyone. We are very glad to be joining forces with the Carter Center and organize today's event to mark International Day of Democracy. You know, for our office, and I'm sure we will hear from, um, I mean, similar things from the speakers today, but for our office, elections represent an opportunity to, for people to exercise, to enjoy their human rights. Not only the right to vote, obviously, but also other connected rights. Think of free speech, freedom of association, etc. There is also a heightened risk during electoral periods that human rights may be abused. That is the, the negative side of it, if you wish. Um, with the purpose of clarifying this relationship between human rights and elections, and also with the purpose of explaining that existing guidance that exists from the United Nations, our office is launching today a new handbook on human rights and elections. I 
know you will be able to find this handbook, this publication in the resources section of the Carter Center platform for this event. So I invite you to, to peruse it, to, to take a look. Let me say a few words about the handbook so you know what it is about. Um, what the handbook does, it really comprehensively outlines international human rights standards that are applicable in the context of elections. It reflects the many developments in the field in the last few decades, including those developments, that guidance that derives from jurisprudence from the United Nations human rights mechanisms. Um, it also um, contains some reflections on, on some, of, some of the new human rights challenges that have um, arisen in electoral context. With this, I mean um, new, new issues such as online disinformation or internet shutdowns. We believe the handbook will be a very useful tool to raise awareness and build technical capacity on human rights issues in elections, both for people that work on human rights already, um, but also for people that come from other walks of life. So we, we really invite you to take a look. As I said, a link to this new publication launched today uh, should be found um, probably in this page, but if you scroll down. So without um, much further ado, I just would like to thank the Carter Center again for organizing this event with us. Thank, to, thank you to all speakers for, um, for being here today. And I really look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Hernan. Um, the, uh, as you've mentioned, the, the link to, to your handbook and to several other resources can be found farther down, I think, on, on the main page for the, uh, for the Forum on Human Rights. So I hope that people will have a, a chance to, to look at those. Um, and just to once again thank you, Hernan, and the Office of the High Commissioner for our, our long and uh, productive collaboration, including on the Human Rights and Election Standards Plan of Action, which is also on the a link at the bottom of today's page. Okay, so uh, to go ahead and to start the discussion, let, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce to you all of the panelists. I'll, I'll do them uh, all together at once, and then we'll go right into the discussion. So first, um, joining us alphabetically is uh, Roberto de Sogas. He's the deputy head of the Regional Office for Central America and the Dominican Republic. United Nations Human Rights. He's a human rights officer with 23 years of ex experience focused on human rights violations monitoring in a number of UN institutions. He's currently coordinator of a team that is based at the High Commission's Regional Office for Central America in Panama City and is monitoring the situation in, uh, in Nicaragua. Next, um, my pleasure to introduce Megan Fitzgerald. She's the head of elections at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, OSCE and their Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, which we love to call ODIR. <clears throat> She's a lawyer specializing in democratic governance and elections and has spent her career advising countries on election reform and building stronger democratic institutions. She has managed election missions uh, for the USCE, the Carter Center, and also the UN. Next, we have Leah Mataba. She's the executive director of the Zambia Council for Social Development, uh, a membership-based uh, national platform for Zambian civil society organizations. She has over 15 years of experience working to promote social political development with a focus on the participation of women, youth, and persons with disabilities in elections and other political processes. And last, uh, we have Anne Okutoyi. She's the Director of Research, Advocacy, and Outreach at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Uh, Anne's a human rights lawyer with over 15 years experience in both domestic and international organizations that focused on marginalized groups. In addition to her role as a Director of Research and Advocacy, she's also the head of the Elections Project at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. So as we uh, just begin now, I'd just like to remind uh, the audience that you're able to participate uh, in the live chat and to ask questions to the panel. Um, you'll need to join the forum on human rights uh, and complete the forum that's on the roundtable page to be able to do that. So we, we hope that uh, some of you will be able to, to ask us some questions. So to start today, um, you know, the central theme of today's panel really is this important connection between human rights and elections. And I think it's a point that all of you will, will agree on if I say 
that it's, it's really impossible to have good, credible, genuine democratic elections in a context where human rights are not broadly respected. But I'd like to ask each of you if you could provide an example or two from your experience and your careers and your organizations that can help illustrate this. And I'll, I'll go um, in the same order that I introduced um, the panelists. So Roberto, if we can start with you, please. Okay, thank you and good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are uh, and happy International Demo Day of Democracy. Um, but before starting, I would briefly like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some observations based on the work of the UN Human Rights Regional Office for Central America and specifically on monitoring activities that we are being regularly carrying out on this situation in Nicaragua. As uh, regards the answer to your question, when human rights, in particular civil and, and political rights, are generated and respected, trust in elections increases as people are able to express their will freely and in condition of equality. Conversely, at the UN Human Rights Office, we have seen time and again how lack of respect of human, for human rights can neg negatively affect the credibility of an election. Take the example for, of Nicaragua, which is preparing for election in November of this year. Nicaraguans should be able to exercise their right to vote without intimidation, violence, or administrative interference. Those who wish to do so should be able to freely present their candidacies, and voters should be able to engage in election campaigns. It is also essential that the media be able to cover the electoral campaigns of all candidates, free from interference or undue restrictions imposed by the authority. But none of this is happening today in Nicaragua. During the last three months, our office has documented arbitrary detentions of 36 people, including political leaders, human rights defenders, business people, journalists, and peace and student leaders, as well as six men and one woman who publicly stated that they wanted to run for the presidency. In several of these arbitrary detention decide, especially in the case of women, there was torture and ill treatment. Moreover, the Supreme Electoral Council uh, arbitrarily cancelled the legal personality of three political parties without them being able to present their defense. These decisions eliminated all possible options for the candidacies of the main opposition groups. Moreover, attacks on freedom of expression have intensified. On 13 August, the police raided the premises of the oldest Nicaraguan newspaper, La Prensa, and arrested its managing director. And regarding freedom of expression, in less than one month, the authority ordered the closure of 45 nonprofit organizations, including uh, six international in develop NGO dedicated to development, uh, and uh, a number, more than 15 medical associations that uh, uh, express uh, criticisms uh, again, the uh, state response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Credible elections are built, among other things, on inclusive and non-discriminatory processes through which citizens can have a meaningful voice. And particular attention should be given to safeguard civil society space to participate in electoral processes without undue restriction. But under the current circumstances in Nicaragua, as you have just heard, these conditions seem to be absent. Thank, Thank you, Roberto. And, and we'll come back to you maybe with uh, another opportunity to, to speak about Nicaragua. Uh, I'm going to go next to, to Megan Fitzgerald at the OSCE. Can you maybe cite a few examples that illustrate the, the importance of this connection, Megan? Yes, thank you, David. And thanks also for the invitation to join you here today on the International Day of Democracy. Oh dear, as other observers, takes a comprehensive approach to looking at the environment the elections are taking place in. It is clear that we can't have democratic elections without respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. In the context of elections, we naturally look at issues such as freedom of expression, 
the ability of media to function independently, freedom of assembly, but also issues such as freedom of association and the independence of the judiciary. On freedom of association, we look at how uh, and what restrictions are in place on the formation of parties and their activities. Um, for example, we are currently in Uzbekistan and already in our needs assessment re mission report, we identified a concern that the strict rules on party formation may limit political pluralism in this election. It limits the number of candidates that can participate. But we also look on freedom of association in terms of how civil society can function. One good example there is uh, our observations and our work in Hungary, where we looked cl very closely at the rules that were resulting in the closure or significant curtailing of NGO activities that impacted the role that civil society could play and the check that they provide. Um, on independence of the judiciary, you can't obviously have a de democratic process without a fully independent judiciary in place to protect the rights of the people. I participated in a mission in Azerbaijan where we looked very closely at this. We did so by following the election disputes in a comprehensive manner and conducting a trial monitoring of those dispute resolutions. And through that monitoring, we were able to document incidences where the judiciary showed that they lacked independence or neutrality through their tone of questioning, through their approach to the different parties and their in-hearing decisions. I wanted to note uh, that it's also important that we not only look at countries where they don't have the political will to respect the fundamental rights and freedoms, um, but also where states are legitimately unable to protect such rights. Uh, such as in countries where they have an ongoing conflict or have recently out of a conflict, like for the OSCE region, Ukraine, for example. In the context, recent context, of course, we have had a look at how they can organize democratic elections when they are not in the position to assure certain human rights and fundamental freedoms. A very obvious one is assembly. For you. At the start of the pandemic, we made a statement about Poland in this regards, um, as they were trying to push forward with elections uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic. And we really said that we had a genuine opportunity to campaign and the opportunity to public debate, then democratic elections were possible. So a few examples that I thought could have a discussion. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, next, I'd like to ask Leah Mitaba from uh, Zambia Council for Social Development. Z Leah, can you maybe mention a few examples that illustrate this connection in, in your experience in Zambia? All right, so thank you very, very much uh, for the opportunity um, and um, wishing everybody a happy uh, International Day of Democracy. For Zambia, I think we are reminded of how important this day is because we just uh, recently concluded having um, our general election which was the 7th on August 12th and uh, through that election and before the election we saw closely how human rights and democracy are interlinked because we saw um, an election period that was characterized with a shrinking civic space all the way through from 2018, 19, 20, we had uh, um, a growing intolerance on the part of uh, the government uh, towards the dissent. So during this period, uh, NGOs, for instance, could not be allowed to picket, uh, much less even convene and have uh, meetings regarding issues that are of interest. So you see already that important freedoms of expression, uh, freedoms of assembly and association were actually denied. And this was exacerbated, as my colleagues have alluded to, uh, uh, when the COVID pandemic hit, because then also we saw restrictive legislation developed which curtailed uh, people's ability to convene and be able to participate in the governance and development of the country. But then with the COVID uh, restrictions that were introduced, we also saw, while appreciating why they were introduced, but we also saw an equal implementation of that law. For 
instance, the ruling party was seen many times flaunting the COVID regulations. But I think when it came to civil society, all the opposition, we were denied. In some cases, we had arrests um, against youths, for instance, who chose to protest against what they saw as bad governance. The other thing that we saw um, deny Zambians a chance to, to participate and uh, enjoy their democratic rights was through ex extreme violence. So for instance, the eve of uh, Christmas in 2020, we had two, two citizens that were that lost their lives through an extrajudicial killing. Uh, and this was at the hands of the police. So we had the political party, opposition, uh, political party sympathize, uh, be shot down. But then in the process, uh, one of the prosecutors who was in the way again was you know gunned down by the police. So you could see that um, this unequal implementation of the law and then also the violence was also sending threats to the Zambian citizens to convene. So political parties stopped convening, uh, civil society also call, uh, stopped convening, and then they, they were silent. Uh, the third issue that we observe uh, that goes against human rights is what we've always spoken about, to say women's rights are human rights. Uh, we talk about the youth. We have Zambia, which is largely a youthful population, so our population pyramid is bottom heavy, but we have a political dispensation that denies women and young people to participate in the decision-making uh, processes, uh, much less to even sit on the decision-making table. So we still see women and youths be kingmakers, um, but when it's time to sit on the decision-making table, they are left out. So we have a parliament which has actually a lower representation, for instance, when we look at insofar as women and youth uh, representation is, out of the 156 members of parliament, only about 20 are female. Mm -hmm. When we look again at the cabinet selection, we also see out of about 26 cabinet ministers, we only have four females. Uh, we only have one youth. But then when you listen to the president speak, he will talk about uh, probably the youth votes having had a significant influence to the outcome of the August 12 election. So whilst the women and the youths are allowed to participate and encouraged to participate as voters, I think we still have a Zambia that doesn't appreciate the potential that women have to be able to take up leadership position and um, participate in the governance and development of our uh, country. The, th uh, the, the, the final scenario I'd like to talk about is the legislative environment. We have seen in recent past the government actually use the legislative environment to crack down on civil society. So we saw the enactment of the cyber legislation, which is not developed from um, a human rights perspective. And this is despite Zambia being state part to many human rights obligations uh, that compel us to develop our laws from a human rights-based perspective. We also have uh, the NGO Act, which was notorious, and I think uh, civil society organizations actually um, rose against it. Again, it's not been developed from a human rights-based perspective. We have even gone to the extent as a country to use the FATF recommendations, which are the Financial Action Task Force recommendations, to actually stifle civic space. Um, since establishment, the EU has actually um, revised the recommendations and recommendation eight of the FATF uh, laws actually speak to the necessity to have civil society and other stakeholders on board as partners and be able if possible to implement the FATF laws from uh, a participatory uh, perspective but we still see this being used as a tool to deny um, uh, Zambians uh, the ability to enjoy their democracy so uh, from our perspective as ATSD, we, we, we call them just ended uh, elections. Yes, it might be seen as a victory, but I think what we saw is that because of the cracking civic space and then also the violence that uh, characterized the election period, we saw Zambians rise and um, challenge the ruling party. So we see this not only as an opposition victory, but also we see this as a potentially protest vote against a regime which was seen as corrupt, which was seen as um, uh, dis uh, dissenting, not embracing of uh, alternative voice. 
And of course, the final one, we see still women and young people uh, silenced through this patriarchal process of uh, gaining political power. Thank you, Leah. Um, I appreciate, in particular, the uh, your uh, your examples really bringing out the extra obstacles and challenges and barriers to populations that have been marginalized to, to fully participate, and and the extra effort that's going to be needed to ensure their full, genuine participation in electoral processes and other political processes. Uh, last, I'd like to go uh, on this opening question to Anne. And Anne, um, I'm going to ask a, uh, another question to you on uh, the upcoming elections in, in, in Kenya. But maybe if you could just uh, speak uh, in general about some examples that bring out this connection between human rights and elections from your work uh, on the National Commission or, or other previous experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, David, and happy International Day of Democracy to all. Um, very briefly, um, I just want to reiterate what the previous speakers have spoken about in terms of human rights being a critical component to a free, fair, and credible election. And in the absence of human rights, then the right to vote and really the right to be voted for is seriously compromised. So David, as you'd mentioned, we are just about, uh, we are preparing for our next general election next year, August in 2022. But allow me to give you examples from the previous elections that the commission has been monitoring and really giving the examples on how human rights is closely interlinked with the right to free and fair elections. So I'll give an example from the 2017 uh, general election and specifically on the consequences that the commission noted uh, that came with the non-adherence to the right to security and also freedom from torture of all during the election, especially in the context of carrying out um, the right to assembly, picket and demonstrate. So if you look at uh, what was happening at that time is that because of the malpractices um, that had been experienced in the past election elections, um, the, it generated a huge momentum for the need to undertake electoral reforms ahead of this election. So basically those are sustained, you know, demonstrations and call for boycotts if this was not met. But unfortunately, this was also met with brutal um, and excessive use of force and firearms uh, by the security agents. So in this regard, the commission documented um, you know, over 250 cases of assault and torture over this period. And uh, this accountability for these cases really remain unachieved. But I think what is most worrying was the rising cases of sexual violence being employed as a weapon of conflict in the disputed elections, where the commission documented 201 cases, which is a very worrying trend. And actually, um, uh, 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 really, in terms of democracy, um, is 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 uh, moving a step backwards. So basically, by having sexual violence um, during the election, it really discouraged victims and other members of society basically from participating in the elections. Especially since in Kenya, the fresh presidential the presidential polls were actually nullified, and we had to undergo a fresh presidential polls that was really marred by boycotts. Um, um, violence, unrest, and of course, gender-based violence. Allow me to give a last example, but and this is with regards, and it has been already alluded to by the previous speakers, with regards to the right to association and also freedom of expression. And what we witnessed in our last elections was basically um, uh, violations of this, especially of the dissident and opposing voices. So. Um, this resulted to stifling of the civic space where the vocal civil society organizations, especially those who are parties in the Supreme Court case that challenged the presidential polls, were targeted and a good number deregistered on unclear allegations. And the effect, therefore, that this has is that the, it dilutes the strength of the civil society organizations who we know play an important watchdog role in ensuring that the elections are free and fair. So uh, lastly, um, again, with regards to this uh, particular thematic human rights area, is that other opposing voices like human rights defenders, bloggers, journalists, and also opposition figures were targeted, harassed, and intimidated, especially by the security officers. And this led to arbitrary arrests, um, and, and especially in the run-up 
in the clamor for electoral reforms just before the 2017 general election. So uh, generally, uh, David, what I can say is that as a commission, we continue documenting even cases where observers and indeed our human rights monitors were either denied entry into the campaign venues or polling centers. And we all know if you do that, then the result is that the level of scrutiny on the election cycle is reduced and it creates an opportunity for electoral malpractices. Um, that's what I can say for now, David. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and this is a really good example of um, human rights institutions working on, on election issues. Let me um, actually go back to you, Anne, with a, with a follow-up question. Knowing that elections in Kenya are coming again, uh, I guess, in less than a year, in August 2022, um, can you say a little bit about um, any you know, plans that you have to work around the 2022 elections and anything that um, you know, you've learned from your past experience that you might uh, you know, change how you're approaching the upcoming elections in Kenya. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and very correct. In Kenya, um, we are now preparing for next general election that will be held in August um, next year. So uh, my commission um, as an accredited status, National Human Rights Institution, and over the years, having you know become a repository of data on human rights and election, is that we shall, as traditionally we have, engage in monitoring the election cycle. So from you know, the preparations um, all the way to the polling and the post-election scenarios, um, and with the main aim of ensuring that there is a human rights-based approach. And based on the discussions that we've just had on the close linkage on human rights and um, democracy and free and fair election. So in order for us as a commission to undertake this very important um, mandate is that first we've developed an election monitoring strategy and really divided it into four phases based on the electoral cycle in Kenya. So right now we are on the first phase, which is the preparatory. And this is an opportunity for us as a human rights um, institutions to be able to lobby and advocate for mainstreaming human rights principles by the key election actors as they're setting up their systems, their laws and their policies ahead of the election. So what we have done is that we have developed a matrix of the recommendations that we did out of our monitoring reports in 2017. And what we are doing now is having a discussions with the various actors, the duty bearers on how far they are, how many recommendations of ours have they picked and the current status of implementation. And for those that have not been implemented, then we are planning to have high level advocacy and lobby meetings, especially with the election management body, the national police service, political parties, and also the office of the director of public prosecutions among other key actors. Again, in this preparatory stage, um, we want to embark on an enhanced public awareness and really to educate members again on the linkages between human rights and election and why it's important um, that they cast their votes wisely um, because it has a ripple effect on the enjoyment of human rights. And very important for us is empowering members of the public with the requisite knowledge so that they can be able to demand um, you know, for accountability when violations happen at the community level. And then of course, the second and the third um, phase of our strategy really is the actual monitoring where we will deploy our monitors to the field to monitor this, the, the, the election cycle from the political party nomination that is very critical in our country, all the way to the campaigns, um, to the polling um, process and also the post-election scenarios thereof. Uh, so what have we learned, David? Um, I think uh, in terms of really uh, what we want to, you know, do the same that we did in 2017 is anchoring on technology. And especially now with the restrictions that have come with the COVID-19 pandemic is that we have in place an in-house um, elections monitoring digital system. And this system is able to collect, analyze data in real time um, from our field monitors. And it gives us indicators, for instance, on hotspots, what are the priority areas that actors should um, intervene on, and some of the emerging human rights issues. So basically, this is our early warning and response mechanisms. And it's 
it really helps us in terms of ensuring that we are able um, to have timely and remedial actions, especially when violations happen. Uh, so in terms of what have we learned, we have done this from 2005. And over the years, we keep learning with the aim of improving our mandate. One of the things that we have learned is that election monitoring is a cycle. And it's yeah. not just um, on the polling day, but it's very important to start this engagement um, way in advance, especially at the preparatory stage, because there are so many benefits in terms and opportunities in terms of influencing change um, among uh, the duty bearers. So that's Thank the plan you. that we have um, currently, David. Thank you, Anne. And, um, I, hearing hearing your response and the responses of others has already reminded me how useful it would be to be able to talk to each of you for um, a whole devoted hour or more uh, to really have a chance to hear more details because uh, it's impressive the the efforts and the, the systems you're, you're putting in place. Let me um, turn quickly now to Megan. Uh, Megan, the OSCE ODIR is widely recognized as you know, one of the leading international election observation organizations that works on democracy and elections. You, you mentioned a few things in your, in your first response. Could, could you say a little bit more about the kinds of uh, methodologies, steps, approaches that ODIR uses to really uh, ensure that you adequately fully address human rights questions in your work in observing elections. And, um, thanks for the words about We are quite proud of our, um, and of course, I would like to say, uh, reiterating what you just said, uh, that it not about a single day, it is much more about the entire process, the entire electoral cycle, and the ongoing and the electing place. And but uh, what the year does, uh, we do a comprehensive look at the respect for human country where we are, living. and we always analyze how freedom of association. Extension and uh, some of the other I mentioned are, are guaranteed in legislation and practice. At legislation, we do look at key uh, judgments and decisions of human rights uh, mechanisms and and uh, instruments. Uh, I hear that my camera, my audio is breaking, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, we do so also looking at the practice. We do that through our long-term observers and uh, they, that are based throughout the country. Um, those long-term observers go to rallies and they see the expression of the, the exercise of the freedom of a, assembly in practice. They see the conduct of the police. They meet, meet with the local civil society and see how they are able to organize themselves and to conduct their activities. They also attend the court cases, like I mentioned in the previous examples, um, and where we analyze the independence of the judiciary at both the local and national level. At the national level, our experts are also looking at things such as violations of human rights that may, may prevent someone from participating in the elections, such as lack of a fair trial that leads to ineligibility as a candidate. This was something that was mentioned by Roberto in regards to Nicaragua. Um, one big area, and I'm grateful for Leah for highlighting it, is inclusivity of the election process. And so we do always look at any barriers to women's participation and any other areas uh, that impact um, the participation of minorities or persons with disabilities or any discrimination that is detected in the process. Um, one interesting thing that you may not think we look at, but we do is uh, how key legislation is adopted, whether or not the process was open and consultative, um, because we firmly believe that you have to have good legislation in place in order to protect the uh, rights of the people. 
And finally, I mentioned that we have uh, comprehensive media monitoring as part of our election observation activities. And those media experts and analysts uh, do a lot of work to detect uh, the independence of the media and the ability of the media and journalists to function independently and safely. Um, and in conclusion, Anne also mentioned recommendations and the importance of following up on those recommendations and the advocacy. So that has been a growing area of ODIR's work as well. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Lee, I'm going to ask you, um, you, you talked quite a bit already about the, uh, the elections last year, but maybe more generally, the Zambia Council for Social Development, where you work, uh, can you say a bit more about how you look at the intersection of human rights and elections in, in your work generally on monitoring, reporting, and doing advocacy? All right, thank you so, so much, uh, David. So, so uh, what we do is we work at several parts. Um, so we work at the legislative environment. So generally we look at national legislation, we look at regional legislation, and also we look at international the, uh, legislative environment. So in regards to uh, the elections, for instance, and inclusivity, and uh, working towards advocacy, uh, advocacy around reducing inequalities, we work uh, closely with our SDGs, uh, 16 and 17, which calls for widening of um, civic space, appreciating the role that partnerships, uh, active and real partnerships can work towards um, development and greater equality for all. So as um, ZCSD, we do participate in the voluntary national review processes by developing shadow reports, but then also participating in the United Nations high-level political forum. And uh, in 2020, we act actually produced um, uh, a, 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 a report on the situation of civic space. And I think as one of the colleagues alluded to earlier on, I think it must have been in um, the opening. Max, uh, We're losing your audio, uh, Leah. The restrictive in, uh, if you, oh, sorry. And I, I can't remember where you, um, uh, lost me. But then I was talking about uh, the work that we do at the international level, engaging with the SDGs, specifically Go 16 and 17 of the SDGs, to ensure that civil society and other stakeholders adequately participate, but then also monitor the progress that we're making towards implementing the SDGs. The other level that we work on is the International um, Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and ZCSD did convene a number of civil society organizations, network organizations, to track progress uh, that Zambia has made towards this implementation, identify gaps and make recommendations, and that was submitted to the organization of the Human Rights Commissioner. And uh, we are hoping that at the point that Zambia is going under review, we'll have a chance also to participate in that process. Then finally, we also look at the national legislative environment. And so we do work around having and ensuring that we have an enabling environment for civil society to participate. So we're interested in our legislation, such as the NGO Act, the Fertif, uh, localization, uh, cyber laws, as well as issues around inequality. So we're interested in the national gender policy, the youth policy, the disability policy, which sadly Zambia is doing so well around. And we're hoping that even with the new government, which is focusing on economic recovery, there's still going to be attention paid to the majority of the Zambians that are poor. So the need for social protection is still relevant. The need also to bridge the gender and uh, youth gaps is also very important. And finally, we also collaborate through spaces such as this one that has been created by the Carter Center to participate and also highlight some of the work that we're doing. And then also, um, we are keen to learn from what is happening already. I think from the presentation, even from this space, we see that there's some good work happening in Kenya. And so already we think towards how do we learn from these exper experiences? How do we also share to ensure that um, we also find strategies that are working to address um, some of these um, things that are obtaining that are not uh, right and are a threat to democracy. Thank you, Leah.
Thank you. And um, I'd like to turn to Roberto now, and then um, hopefully there'll be time for uh, another question or two to each of you. Um, we're using more time than I thought going through this first round of questions. But Roberto, the Office of the High Commission really works to ensure that elections can be held in an environment where there's respect for human rights. Generally speaking, in, in the uh, Central American region where you're working, what, what do you see as the main gaps in this work? <clears throat> Thank you, David, for your question. I hope that you can hear me well because we are under a th thunderstorm uh, now. We can hear Panama. you. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Latin, America, Latin America and particularly Central American countries face different challenges that in some cases uh, were also exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as regards human rights, the main gaps concern discrimination against women or against certain groups such as persons of, with disabilities or indigenous people uh, and particularly women in politics are facing increased harassment and attacks including online uh, the right of peaceful assembly continues to be unduly restricted in several countries in the region and force is used against demonstrator in an a necessary or excessive manner. For example, in Nicaragua, the police uh, has been applying a de, de facto ban of all the demonstrations staged or that attempted to stage uh, the opposition sectors. Uh, and in addition, media laws and regulation failed in various cases to provide for safeguards against political censorship unfair advantage to certain political parties and unequal access during the electoral period. And more in general, they did not manage to prevent overall interference with the right to freedom of expression. And finally, new challenges to participatory rights and the integrity of elections have emerged, often facilitated or propagated by new technologies such as uh, hate speech, internet blocking, or disinformation campaign. Uh, the National Assembly in Nicaragua adopted in October, in past October, uh, a new law on cybercrime that uh, uh, penalized the, uh, those who disseminate uh, fake news uh, in, on social media or online. And uh, uh, the UN expert warned at the time that uh, the law could, that has a very vague wording could be used to uh, criminalize the opposition. And uh, uh, less than one week ago, we already registered the first case that uh, when a, a, a director of an, an environment NGO uh, has been accused, has been charged, formally charged uh, for uh, its uh, um, claims, its public claims about a massacre in, uh, that happened in, in, on, 20, on 23 August in, in indigenous territory. And well, that will be some of the examples that, that I can share with you. Thank you, Roberto. Um, I'm going to try to ask each of you uh, one more question, but uh, before I do that, I just wanted to maybe also say, uh, draw attention to the Human Rights and Elections Plan of Action that the Carter Center and the Office of the High Commissioner worked on together uh, several years ago. And one of the central themes there is the importance of getting groups uh, that work on um, civil and political rights outside of the narrow election community to use the, the human rights mechanisms and treaty bodies and others to, to draw attention to human rights issues in the context of elections and to help identify problems and gaps even in how those issues are fully addressed in the international human rights law system and, and treaty bodies so that they could be perhaps fully uh, further articulated and help us address those things. Um, Leah, in the context of your work around elections in Zambia, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of interesting things regarding shadow reports and other activities of the, the uh, Council for Social Development. But uh, is there anything else you could say about your work around elections and how a group that's working broadly on rights of participation is engaging with the human rights mechanisms as a way to help uh, the work that you do? 
All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, David. So yes, um, Zambia Council for Social Development. So we've received uh, support from the Carter Center, and we're working across um, uh, all the ten provinces in Zambia. So specifically, ZTSD is in about six provinces. And in those provinces, what we're trying to do is to get the ordinary Zambian to participate in the whole electoral and democratic uh, space. So, for instance, we have um, also identified that in Zambia, the traditional leaders play a very important role uh, insofar as democracies are concerned. So culture still expects to a great extent for a woman to be restricted to the kitchen. But then uh, the discussions that we've been having so far with about five chief, chiefdoms, we've seen that um, the traditional leaders are warming up. And uh, for instance, there's a case in Southern province, which has been um, one of the most highly patriarchal places in the three constituencies that we were working. There were only men, none of them were youth. In about uh, 26 uh, wards, they were only occupied by men and none of them were youths. So through the advocacy and interaction we had to gather evidence and be able to engage the political parties, we still see now a small glimmer of hope in terms of uh, increasing the participation of women and um, uh, young people in the electoral uh, process. But then it's also giving us uh, real-time evidence with which now to submit, even as we engage with the different human rights-related um, uh, instruments, such as the ICP, uh, ICCPR that I, uh, I I spoke to, so I think that's uh, one uh, yeah. way in which we are doing that. Thank you, Leah. Um, and if I could ask you, um, you spoke already uh, quite a bit about the the elections and the and the work of the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights around elections. But if there's anything else you would want to say, both uh, uh, in terms of a a national human rights institution engaging not just on the you know the broad human rights issues but connecting to the international mechanisms uh, on civil and political rights but also on economic social and cultural rights uh, the the experience that you have in the in the kenya national commission um thank you very much uh david and um let me just start by saying that um one of the parameters that we use in terms of how we monitor um, you know, human rights and election is really using the international and regional human rights instruments. So um, what are the relevant provisions and how are they being complied by the state actors? And of course, of importance to us is also, as you say, economic, social and cultural rights, because it really does um, have a linkage both during the election cycles themselves, but also um, after um, the elections. Um, so for instance, during the campaigns, when you're looking at issues around corruption, bribery, um, and unfair finance campaigning, it really uh, marginalizes com um, candidates that are not able to compete um, on the same um, you know, footing uh, with other candidates. Then when you look at instances where civil and political rights are violated, for instance, issues around security, freedom of assembly, then it has a ripple effect on the economic, social, and cultural rights. For instance, the commission continues documenting cases of evictions um, and displacements, uh, for instance, of certain tribes from what are, are you know, political perceived um, strongholds. So when these displacements happen, David, then in turn, they affect other rights like education, um, especially with children, um, you know, with the academic calendars um, being disrupted, issues around food um, because uh, the, the roads are blocked and uh, commodities can be cannot be able to meet to meet um, you know to reach um, the members of the public and also issues around shelter when you're chased away from your home during violence then it really affects your right to shelter and other rights um, like health. We had um, cases in 2017 where we documented um, the sexual violence uh, during election and 90% of the victims we talked to actually said that they could not access hospitals um, in time because the roads were barricaded, uh, you know, by the, by the unrest that was outside their homes. So very, very important 
that human rights institutions and other 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 human rights actors that are monitoring to really play a keen um, 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 you know a focus on economic social and cultural rights then again lastly allow me to mention David that um, um, we we carry out these campaigns in terms of telling people that who you vote for as your leader has an effect on the delivery of services, the, you know, the basic needs, the economic, social, and cultural rights. So we continue carrying out these public campaigns to educate citizens on the linkages between the elections and after the governments and the leaders they, they have they have voted for, after the governments are formed, it shall have an effect on how the delivery is carried out. So really rallying around um, uh, uh, the citizenry to focus on issue based, to really interrogate the manifestos of candidates so that they can be able to vote wisely, um, uh, David. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for those very concrete examples that I really bring a lot of uh, images to mind. Um, Megan, if I can ask you uh, in, in your work at the OSCE ODEER, um, for folks who don't uh, maybe know so much, you work on uh, the region that, that includes the US, Canada, Europe, Russia, and other states in the region. Um, and I know that uh, the work that you do is, is very much based on um, a rights-based approach, and as you've already given, given examples of that, but I'm wondering in your work in different countries, how the connection, the relationship between human rights and elections, um, how that conversation and the political discussions about that conversation might vary. And uh, I don't know, is, is Megan here? I'm not seeing her. I might have to. I'm here. I'm ah, here. there you are. No, okay. But I'm here, but uh, no thanks. Uh, Actually, today we just opened our 400th mission, um, uh, and uh, since 1996, and and we do we have observed in 51 of the 57 participating states that Odia works in. We're currently in countries such as Canada, Germany, Uzbekistan, Georgia, North Macedonia. So yes, of course, the the dialogue around human rights and the need for their protection does differ. Um, and more accurately, maybe the political will um, for differs for how uh, they uh, re want to be looked at and how they how serious they take it, uh, their desire to be analyzed in terms of their respect for human rights. But I did want to first mention that we do apply the same standards uh, to all states where we observe and uh, we do hold all states to the same international standards and the same commitments that they've committed themselves to um, for human rights and fundamental freedoms. You mentioned Russia and uh, elections are this weekend so it is a topical country to mention. Um, we are not there and that's because Russia insisted on limiting the number of observers that they will allow to come and they expressed that they do not have an obligation to invite us in the format that we feel and we determine is necessary to credibly observe. And so this of course speaks to what I was mentioning about their openness to having their process and their environment for the elections analyzed. You also mentioned the US and with the US and some other countries that uh, some may consider to have more established democracies, we have seen that there is not always an awareness that they need to work further on their processes and they need to do more to protect their human rights. So the challenge for us in countries like the US is getting the recognition um, at the necessary levels of, of the value of our analysis and the follow-up on the protection. Um, I think what is underemphasized in our work and I'm uh, trying to work to emphasize it more and it was mentioned by my colleagues is the obligation of the state and what we need to be looking at is not only are these rights being protected or not but what are the states doing to correct violations and to address the violations. Um, 
And with that, I'll, I, I will stop for time's sake so we can Thank hear from a few colleagues. Thank you, uh, Megan. I'm going to ask a question to Roberto, and then I've got uh, one last question I'll ask all of you, but it will need to be very brief in that final question. Roberto, um, international human rights monitoring in, in Central America, you know, there's, there's difficult situations uh, across the region. Uh, you mentioned a little bit already about Nicaragua. I don't know if you'd want to say any more about some of the, the challenges and the importance of international human rights monitoring there uh, and we also know that you know elections are coming up in Honduras but um, any any further um, uh, perspectives or examples you'd like to, to offer before we go to a last question okay uh, well no, no, not really I would just uh, like to point out that uh, uh, definitely not not really an example but uh, some consideration about the uh, plan of action, you know, but because uh, in the recent years we definitely have seen greater, greater engagement between the human rights and the election communities, and uh, uh, an, un an understanding that our work overlaps and is complementary to a great extent. Um, and the, in, in, to this end, and moving forward, I would like to point out three ideas to continue to advance this goal. The first one is to increase the use of international human rights law and human rights mechanisms in the context of the elections in all countries, including established democracies. As we have seen in several countries, there are attacks on some basic principles of elections and international law policies and law provides concrete guidance on how to halt this attack. The second is to keep exploring the need for a new human rights mechanisms that focus more specifically on the right to participate. And the third one is to continue expanding and defending the essential role of civil society during the election. I think that these three ideas also apply to the uh, situation that we are observing in Central America. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, and you, you anticipated my last question. So I don't know, I'll, I'll just ask very quickly, if Megan, Anne, and Leah, if you have anything else that you would like to address, is in particular on the, the plan of actions recommendations regarding how we can make greater use of international human rights law and mechanisms to really strengthen uh, human rights, but human rights in the context of elections, given the challenges we're facing globally. Uh, I'll start with um, Leah, and then um, go Anne and, and Megan, but very briefly, please. All right. Okay. Thank you so very much. So for the Zambia Council for Social Development, we're thinking that this way can be used to provide evidence for advocacy on accelerating the implementation of national, regional, and international youth and gender, as well as minority-related obligations that Zambia is state party to. And I think the UN at international level, as well as at national level, is very cardinal uh, for this to happen in Zambia. We are noticing that the UN is more towards direct budget support and engagement with the government, and this is excluding uh, the unique um, uh, the unique interaction that the UN in the country as well as civil society could could have to be able to support the government in implementing these obligations. Finally, continued engagement on the ICCPR, the SDGs in particular 16 and 17. Um, is what we see as our way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. And then very briefly, Anne, um, any, any last comments from you on this, uh, the importance of international human rights law and, and connecting to the mechanisms? I know that's central to your work. You're, you're muted. Uh, you, can you hear me now? Can yes, you hear we can. Me now? Okay, um, I, I allow me first just to reiterate that um, in Kenya, we have seen over the years um, the impact that really the regional and international human rights mechanism have had. And every time they issue recommendations, we are able to use that as a very strong tool of advocacy. And I'd like to point out the universal periodic review 
and the Human Rights Committee, which reviewed Kenya earlier this year under the ICCPR. And there were very express recommendations that actually emanated from organizations like ourselves and also civil society organizations on electoral related human rights violations and the need to enhance accountability, um, strengthen investigations and prosecutions of the perpetrators. So. Uh, th when these recommendations come back to the state, we are able to use that as an advocacy tool. And especially with the UPR we've seen, it really helps because of the peer review nature. Um, we are able to really convince government in terms of changing laws, policies, with regards um, to the recommendations that have been given. Uh, so I think largely, David, what I can say is that there's need to continue capacity building, especially around this um, action plan and build consensus at the national level with election actors who in most instances never take human rights as a priority, but rather human rights are seen as coming at the tail end when violations happen. So I think when we have these sustained conversations, it would really um, um, make an impact in terms of linkages of human rights, democracy and elections. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Anne. I think that's really a good example of um, really pointing out how you know the, the states belong to this international community that they're members of these uh, treaty bodies they're members they're they, they've obligated themselves through these treaties and they care about what comes out of the reports of the the UPR process and the treaty body reporting and the regional reporting so that you gives a very great example. Uh, Megan, the last word to you um, uh, on the same question of how we can maybe make greater use of the international human rights law uh, in, in our work on, on elections. Thanks. And, and we do look at the treaty body reports and the UN special rapporteurs reports, and we do try to cite them and mention them along with key decisions and judgments of human rights mechanisms in our observation reports particularly on women's participation, persons with disability, rule of law. But uh, I noticed in the action plan, one of the areas that is identified is that we could do more to address gaps in international law. And I think that's an important area. And uh, ODIR works on that by working together with other organizations like uh, the Venice Commission, to produce guidelines, which is another recommendation on issues such as assembly and association and political parties and political party financing. Um, but we also do it in the context of legal opinions. Uh, and here we have a neat opportunity to partnership with national human rights institutions, as the action plan mentions. And we have some good examples of doing that in Poland and Georgia, where the human rights institutions have been very active. So I think that's another positive way forward. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we, we've gone over time, so I'm just going to just make a, a short remark here to, to close, and that is really just to thank all of you. I hope maybe we'll have another opportunity to, to speak. There's clearly a lot more we could say. Uh, in closing, just want to say that to talk to each of you, I, I find honestly, very inspiring and hopeful in spite of these very difficult times. It really is um, reassuring to see people working all around the world on these, these shared goals. And it's, I think, because of the efforts of people like you and, and many others that we have uh, you know, good reason to be hopeful looking forward. So I want to thank all of you and uh, appreciate everybody in the audience who's listened to, our purchase, uh, to your comments and look forward to connecting again. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Leah. Thank, thank you, Roberto. Thank you very day, much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.